Hello, everyone, and thanks to everyone for joining us today in our first Limit State Ring webinar of 2019. My name is Tom Pritchard. I'm the principal engineer here at Limit State, and I'm also the host for today's session. In a minute, I'll be passing you over to our presenter, and I'll also be rounding up at the end. Today's webinar is titled Make More Informed Masonry Arch Bridge Assessments with Limit State Ring and it's going to provide you all with a broad overview of the capabilities of Limit State Ring which is our masonry arch analysis software and also the technology behind it. The main part of the webinar itself is going to run until approximately 1.10 p.m. UK time and we do include five or ten minutes at the end for you to ask questions. You can post these yourself by the question functionality that is present as a pop-out in the webinar interface that should hopefully be in front of you and we do always try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the webinar and if that's not possible then we do make sure to reply via email in the day or so after. Looking through the attendee list, we have a mixed audience today. Some of you will have used Limit State Ring before, and some of you will be new to it. Hopefully, we'll be able to provide everyone with something new that they can take away regarding the capabilities of the software and how it can be used to streamline your masonry arch bridge assessments. So, without further delay, I'd like to pass you over to our speaker for today, who is Matthew Gilbert, and he's the Limit State Ring product manager. So, over to him. Thanks very much, Tom, and thanks very much for joining us today for the webinar. Right, so I'm just going to uh, give you a, an overview of what we're going to be covering in today's webinar. First of all, I'll say a few words about the company, Limit State, then um, have a look at some fundamentals of the behaviour of masonry arch bridges and, and how that uh, relates to masonry arch bridge analysis. Then move on to look at how we can actually apply the Limit State Ring software to the analysis of arch bridges. And then we'll round up with an um, example, a highway bridge with two spans, and then uh, wrap up with conclusions and questions. Okay, so first of all, just a few words about, um, about Limit State. Um, it's been around now for, I think, about 12 years. Um, the idea is that we uh, develop um, techniques which are um, going to provide engineers with um, powerful methods primarily for the ultimate limit state analysis and design uh, for the purposes of an ultimate limit state analysis and design so it's using methods that are not used in commonly available software um, because we're a, um, a, a company um, our, our job is clearly to make sure the software is robust and well validated and also easy to use um, for users. So we've got customers in around 30 countries worldwide, including um, major international companies, a few of uh, those you can see on screen now. Um, in terms of where our software fits, um, as I mentioned, most of our software is, is for ultimate limit state analysis um, and, and design. Um, we're using optimization techniques um, to get the solutions, and we're using um, rigid plastic analysis in many cases, um, using numerical methods to identify solutions. And what we try to uh, sort of fit in is uh, sort of bridge the gap between traditional hand calculation or automatic hand calculation type methods on the one hand, and what I've, what I've termed on this slide advanced methods on the other. And when I say advanced, I mean for example, I'm taking advantage of um, non-linear finite elements, discrete elements, and so forth. Those methods tend to be um, time-consuming to use, um, both in terms of operator expertise and also in terms of uh, run times. Uh, our products, we try to make sure that the, um, the burden on the user is, is quite minimal, and also um, the speed of operation is, is quick. But on the plus side, we um, provide tools which, uh, because they're based on numerical methods, don't rely on the, the simple assumptions of, of hand calculations. One of the problems with hand calculations is often it's a really neat solution for a specific problem. When you move away from that specific problem, then you're kind of on your own. Um, with these numerical rigid plastic methods, um, we, can, um, we can provide solutions anyway and we can do that quickly. 
Okay, so moving on to uh, masonry uh, bridges. What do we know about them? We know there's, first of all, a lot of them. Uh, many countries, you know, approaching 50% of the, the bridges on the road and rail networks are, are masonry arch bridges. Um, we reckon there's around a million spans worldwide, and the vast majority now are well over 100 years old. We need to assess these bridges if they're carrying traffic to check that they're fit for purpose and often um, we find that uh, they're being subjected to more onerous loads so that even that makes it even more important that we uh, we, we regularly um, assess their capability to carry those loads. Um, if you're not familiar with Mason Arch Bridges just to sort of uh, be aware there's, there's, there's quite a lot of terminology that you need to kind of be, uh, become accustomed to before you can uh, you can progress um, basically you have a masonry arch barrel which spans between abutments um, that arch barrel can be formed of large stone voussoirs stone blocks or it can be composed of brickwork often arranged in multiple rings separated by continuous mortar joints. So that's the arch barrel. We then, um, to form a, a, a nice level um, road or rail surface, we would normally put infill above the, um, the barrel um, and we may have backing as well, which is, is typically f formed from masonry or concrete directly behind the uh, um, the haunches of the of, of the uh, the arch barrel, in order to provide additional resistance. But there's uh, various different um, bits of terminology that will be useful for you to uh, become accustomed to before using um, the software, um, and 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 also using um, literature surrounding masonry arch bridges. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about how how arch bridges stand up or or, or fall down. Um, However, there is a really nice bit of theory which uh, I think I'm going to uh, um, nevertheless explain to you. It's a bit of theory that was developed by Robert Hooke several hundred years ago. He observed that a, a weightless chain would take up, um, if, if, if you look at the, the profile of a weightless chain, um, and then you take the mirror image of that, um, you get the ideal form for a masonry arch. So he said, as hangs a weightless chain, so but inverted stands the masonry arch. So what we've got on screen now is the profile of a, of a hanging weightless chain, but we've actually suspended from that the voussoirs, the stone blocks that we're gonna to use to form the masonry arch. And if we put those in the right locations and then we observe the, the profile of the chain, we then mirror that and then we put those voussoirs um, together in a normal way to form a masonry arch bridge. Then if that profile fits entirely within the masonry, then assuming that we don't get sliding failure, then we can say um, that the the arch bridge is, is safe to carry, it, in this case, it's self-weight. Um, of course, an observation is that um, there are a number of these profiles, which we can now call line of thrust or line of compression, um, that fit entirely within the fitness of the masonry because we're dealing with a, a statically indeterminate form. So you can see we've got three now, three different forms, all of which um, um, or profiles, all of which fit within the, um, the fitness of the masonry. Um, so, unless you know something about the history of your, your arch, um, the materials of which it's formed and so forth, then you can't categorically say how, this, how your, your bridge is actually carrying the load. However, if you apply, for example, a, a load at quarter span and you carry on increasing that load, there comes a point where you can only just fit the, the profile of the um, line of thrust in, in, in inside the masonry. And actually at that point, you have a unique identifier of what the 
load carrying capacity of your structure is. It's now uniquely determined. There is only one um, line of thrust here. Um, and if you apply any more load at all, you will get uh, hinges and you'll get a failure mechanism. So effectively, we can use this to do an analysis of a bridge at the point of collapse. So what, what, what is, uh, is that telling us? Well, first of all, it's telling us that the shape of the arch in relating, relation to the, the loading governs stability. So originally, we, in the first example, we just had self-weight loading, but then we um, applied a quarter span load. So the shape of the arch in relation to the pattern of loading governs stability. What we haven't talked about yet is that if you surround your, your arch with fill material, which we typically do in the, in the masonry arch bridge, then we can get additional reserves of strength. Basically, the, the fill disperses the applied load um, through the fill, which is beneficial. It pre-stresses the barrel just from its self-weight. And as the arch tries to sway into the surrounding fill material, then you get uh, horizontal um, passive restraint. Um, and the third point here is that current assessment methods tend to focus on the ultimate limit state, assuming um, implicitly that the serviceability limit state is satisfied. Now, there are moves afoot to, to, to change that, to, to also um, look at the um, serviceability limit state criteria for assessment, but at the moment, most assessment codes will, will focus on the ultimate limit state, which is what the focus of today's talk is. Okay, so how do we do a masonry arch analysis using limit state ring? Um, and what's different about limit state ring? Um, as I mentioned, um, we use optimization um, tools to identify the load factor or um, magnitude of load at collapse. So these, these techniques are not used in, in, in other commercial software or not, certainly not widely used in other commercial software. Other things that we, we, we focus on is making sure the results from the software are validated against high quality test results. So we've got close links with the University of, of Sheffield, for example, and other universities um, who are um, doing tests. And if we validate the outcomes from the software against those tests, then obviously it increases confidence. And then the last thing is that we've got a user interface which uh, allows the users to use the software really in, in, in two distinct ways. The first way is to rapidly identify the capacity of a bridge using where necessary default properties. And secondly, where you have more in-depth knowledge to actually identify local properties um, that uh, you can enter into your software. And we'll, we'll look at those scenarios uh, shortly. So the first method, quick assessment using wizard, go through all the, uh, the steps of creating your bridge using the default properties and, and you end up uh, um, hopefully having a, a, a good indication for the likely um, capacity of the structure. And that can be done in a matter of minutes. Second mode, if you know about local properties, then you can include those in your analysis. So for example here, we've got a bridge over water, and let's suppose that um, for whatever reason, it's tricky to repoint um, areas where you've got mortar loss out, um, where the mortar has, um, um, has been lost in the, the regions of the haunches, so you can see um, um, that identified, so we've got um, the thickness of the joint shown in, in, in the pinky purple colour, and then we've got actually mortar loss um, near the intrados, near the inner surface of the structure. Um, obviously, the best thing to do is to just point that up. If we, if we want to see what the capacity is without pointing it up, we can do that. We can enter the details of this mortar loss directly, and then we can see what impact that has on the, the mode of response. How does the software work? Well, if we 
take the load from a, a vehicle that's dispersed through initially a surface layer of uh, fill, then through the backfill onto masonry blocks which form the, the arch barrel. These blocks are separated by contacts and it's where all the interesting things happen really, the contacts. We can have sliding, we can have hinging, we can have crushing um, in those contacts. And then finally the arch movement, the barrel movement in this case, is restrained by self-weight and also by um, backfill elements. So the backfill elements are there to uh, model in a, in a simplified way the passive restraint that you get when you push uh, a piece of masonry into the surrounding fill material. And in, in simple terms, um, if you push into those backfill elements, you, you mobilize whatever you've said is the, is, the, is the passive pressure. If you pull away from those, then the default is that you have um, no pressures applied at all. So that's basically saying that um, the default is to neglect active pressures and to model um, passive pressures. And then here we've just got a um, an image just showing the various different um, components of a model. So blocks, um, contacts, and then following an analysis you can see that we have this line of thrust or thrust zone, we have hinges, we have these backfill elements which are active when they're shown in blue. We've got the dispersed load from the axle um, highlighted and so forth. But rather than um, discuss that um, any more detail in the, in, in the slides, I think it's probably the best thing to do is to actually just get the software open and take a look at uh, um, how we can set up and uh, solve a problem using the, uh, the software. So I mentioned the wizard, so I'm going to set up um, using the wizard a, um, a highway bridge example. Um, I'm going to use defaults in many cases and the first thing to do after I've entered details of the project is to set up details of the geometry. Um, what you're able to do is define end standing piers if you if you want um, but the default is that um, actually these are, are not modeled so we'll go along with that default so in other words the end spans are assumed to be founded on on a rigid material by default and then move on to the um, the spans so let's suppose I've got a number of spans um, let's say three spans. So the first span, I need to make a decision about, first of all, what the um, the, the barrel is, is made of. Is it stone voussoir? Is it bonded brick? Or is it multi-ring brick? Um, for now, I'll, I'll say it's a stone voussoir. And I also need to decide how I'm going to represent the, the geometry of the structure. Now, normally for a, a detailed analysis, I would recommend that you use a user-defined shape. However, for a quick analysis, if the, um, the structure that you're dealing with um, appears to be in, in, in good condition and, and you've got um, an indication that it was originally constructed um, segmental, there's, there's not been a great amount of movement or distortion, then you could, for a preliminary analysis, um, assume it's segmental, and then you don't need to specify the span and the rise. So I'll do that, but I'll check the box saying insert span after this, which will allow me then to enter details of the pier. Um, this is a fictitious bridge, so I'll just enter, for example, a pier height of four, four meters, or 4,000 millimeters, and move on to the second span. By default, the second span is exactly the same as the first span. Um, I'll leave that and I'll insert uh, another span. And then by default, the second pier is the same as the first pier. Um, this time I'll perhaps change something slightly. I'll, I'll make it the, the pier slightly uh, 
higher, so five meter high up here. Click next, third span, happy with that. And then move on to the, the right abutment, which I'll keep as the defaults, and then onto the fill profile. So the fill profile um, is basically a, a piecewise linear um, representation um, of the of, of the fill profile. You can also enter details of surface fill layer. So, for example, um, if you've got um, you know, a certain depth of road construction that you want to model differently, then you can define that as a surface fill and, and prescribe a depth accordingly. Move on to um, the next um, area of the the wizard, um, partial factors. Um, basically, according to um, the assessment code that you're using, you can specify partial factors for things like the unit weight of the different materials, and also you can apply partial factors on loads and materials. Just for this rapid uh, run through, I'll keep those as unity. And that takes me on to the materials dialog where I can enter details of the masonry and then later the backfill and surface fill. So for the masonry, I can choose to have different materials for the spans and the piers or for all bridge parts. So I can specify different materials for different spans or the default is to just have all the, um, the masonry the same. In which case, we're interested in this prescribing the unit weight and the compressive strength of the masonry and also the coefficient of friction um, between the, um, the the blocks forming the, the structure. So I go next, I can move on to the backfill. So we're looking for the geotechnical, basic geotechnical parameters, so unit weight, angle of friction and cohesion of the material and also we're asked um, do we want to model the effects of the backfill, the anticipated effects, so the dispersion of the live load and the horizontal passive pressures. If you want to go into this in a bit more detail there are actually various different properties um, that you can uh, review and or change if you, if you have a particular need to do so and there's lots of detail in the manual about how the software actually um, converts these um, basic properties into, uh, into, for example, pressures applied to the, to the bridge. Then move on to the surface fill. So we're looking for uh, unit weight and angle of dispersion. And then finally move on to um, the loads. So I can use a default one kilonewton single axle or I can go to a database and I can enter details of, for example, um, and a, a, a UK um, BD21 um, vehicle, um, a double axle um, load, for example, I can, I can choose that, or I can define my own if I so wish. But if I click finish, then basically I have my geometry of my bridge, I have my applied load, and if I click the, the green button at the top, then you can see that pretty much instantaneously I get um, a solution. And what I've actually got here is in the console window an adequacy factor. This is a multiplier on my applied load at collapse. So that's telling me that if I multiply my axle loads that I apply to the structure by 2.99, then I get failure. This is ignoring any partial factors on the load. I can also um, interact with the, the software. I can actually just move the load around and just get a, a nice feel for how the, how the bridge um, responds to loading. And I can keep an eye on the, um, the adequacy factor and get a sense for um, um, what the um, critical or approximate um, um, critical adequacy factor is a minimum adequacy factor. And what you can also see is that the software, it doesn't choose, for example, a four-hinge mechanism or a, or a seven-hinge mechanism. It actually 
um, uses um, optimization methods to find effectively the minimum energy solution um, for this particular problem. And so when I've placed my vehicle in certain positions, you can see all three spans are involved. If I place the load at other locations, then I have end, end up with a single span um, failure. Um, just um, to just give you an indication of um, of how the um, the second mode can be used, I mentioned um, that you can select properties locally. So, for example, let's suppose that this this pier is in a river. Then what I can do is I can I can edit the um, the contacts and I can I can apply some mortar loss. So I can apply some mortar loss um, as you can see there. So we've actually removed some mortar. My adequacy factor before doing that was 2.65. Um, after doing that, you can see that the adequacy factor has gone down a little bit to 2.43. So you can interact with the model and and make changes as you see fit. Okay, so how did how did that work? Um, what what are, what are the mathematics involved? Well, actually, um, they're fairly simple. Um, what we basically do in the in the current version, at least, is we we maximise a load factor, that's a multiplier or additive factor on on a, on on a external load in the in the problem. Subject to equilibrium constraints, and equilibrium constraints. If you imagine every block, so for example, a, a single block in a pier, what we're looking for is that that block needs to be in equilibrium in the x, y, and rotational sense. What are the the forces applied to the block? Well, obviously it's a self weight load, but it's also forces at the contacts, and so we've actually got a highlighted contact where we've got a normal force, a moment, and a shear force. And we impose limits on the values of those values. So the shear force, for example, is limited by um, the magnitude of the normal force and the prescribed coefficient of friction. Similarly, um, the moment is, is limited by the thickness and the normal force, assuming infinite compressive strength. And actually, we have a nonlinear constraint where we have finite compressive strength. So, maximize lambda subject to equilibrium and yield. And the nice thing about this is it's a, a linear optimization problem, which means it's easy to solve. Um, in terms of verification, um, the original version of the software was actually developed in the early 1990s when I was busily um, testing bridges like the one that you, you see on screen. Um, this is a five meter span, um, four ring um, brickwork arch bridge. And ever since then, we've spent time making sure that we, um, we get good correlation between the software and experimental results. So single spans, multi spans. In more recent years, we've, um, we've constructed bridges in, in effectively an oversized fish tank where we can actually keep track of how the the backfill and the arch barrel are interacting with each other, so we can make sure that we uh, um, we have a sensible soil model. And we've also done that on a smaller scale um, here in Sheffield. We've actually effectively split out all the components that um, contribute to capacity, isolating them. So, for example, in the um, the upper image, we've got the self-weight of soil on the left-hand side. Um, on the second image, we have the self-weight, but also the passive restraint. And we can basically go through and look at the correlation between the um, experimental results and the ring results and, um, and check that we're getting reasonable correlation. OK, so that's um, how it works and what we're, what we're doing to, um, to check um, that it's it's spitting out uh, sensible results. And I've got um, a, a quick example. It's a, a twin span highway bridge. So um, 
you can see some details of the geometry on the on the slide now. It's quite a modest structure. It's two 2.7 meter spans with a 0.7 meter um, thick central pier. Now, what I would say is that um, because masonry arch bridges resist applied loads largely due to their self weight, you can often find that the smaller span bridges are more problematic than the longer span bridges. For a long span bridge, foreseeable live loads are often you know, almost insignificant in relation to the self weight. So live load issues tends to be uh, less important for, for very large structures and correspondingly more important for small structures such as the one that you can see on screen. Um, you can also see that um, it's indicated it's got uh, two wing rings of brickwork forming the arch barrels. And you can't really see, but um, um, it's probably not a particularly um, good representation. But the, um, the arch barrels are both slightly distorted. If we zoom in on a, um, a photograph of the structure, you can see this is it's constructed of soft red bricks. Um, probably can't don't have a big enough view to uh, to see the the profile um, but um, anyway you can see two rings of brickwork and you can see parts of the two spans um, and what I've got um, available is a, a representation of this um, this structure um, and you can see if I clear on to the, um, the span, that I've basically, uh, in this case, I've entered a user-defined span with a number of points, in this case, nine points. What I would suggest is the more points that you, that you get, the better, the, the, the more accurate uh, or, or the closer representation you have um, of reality. And I've got, um, similarly, um, some points defining the um, the right hand uh, span as well. Um, now, in this particular run, um, I've um, assumed that these these two rings of brickwork are well bonded, so it's equivalent to a voussoir bridge. Um, and if I if I look at the um, the loads that are applied to the structure, I can see actually. I've got a single axle, it's a single 11 and a half ton axle, actually with a dynamic factor on there. And if I look at the partial factors, I can see actually um, I've set up partial factors which are relevant to um, the current generation um, assessment codes in the UK for highway bridges. So I've actually got an axle load factor of 1.9 and a dynamic factor of 1.8. So what that means is that when I click solve here, I will get um, an additive factor which is a, a multiplier on a multiplier, if, if, so to speak. If it was a design problem, it would be an over design factor. So I click solve, then um, I get my um, Solution straight away. Um, in this case, it's indicating that a multi span mechanism is critical for this low position. Um, but I can move the, the load around and I can see different um, modes of response. Now, if you want to, um, rather than use this top trial and error approach, then what I can do is I can actually traverse the the load across the bridge. So I can basically use the current load case and then move it along in increments, let's say 200 millimeter increments. And if I do that, then you can see that I have a series of load cases and it's crossing the whole of the bridge. And if I click, click solve now, then basically what the software is doing is it was actually multi going through all those load cases and actually, it's identified that the critical load case is load case 23, 
which I think is exactly where I happen to be sat. But anyway, let's just just to show that that isn't necessarily the case. Let's just uh, start a different position, and yeah, go through all those load cases, and it um, it then um, moves to the uh, to show the load case corresponding to the lowest adequacy factor. So the lowest adequacy factor um, is 1.03 at load case 23. So actually, assuming that the partial factors that I applied were the ones I wanted to apply and there were no other partial factors, then this, this structure appears to be safe based on the assumptions that I've um, used thus far. However, um, I did say this structure has multiple rings and perhaps I want to um, have a look at the situation where the the rings are actually modeled separately with frictional interfaces between them. So I then go to my span tab, I change the multi-ring and that allows me to enter details of the second ring. And let's suppose that we have two rings each of 110. And I need to do the same for the second span. So very um, easy to do. And now if I click solve, then we're going to um, go through the all those um, 30 um, load cases. You see it takes a little bit longer to solve now, but actually it's found the critical location, and again, it's, it's low case 23. So again, I'll move it just to show you that it's not... Um, um, actually, I've just moved it away from 23, so um, um, it's now going to be um, at 22. So I actually shouldn't have done that. I, I should have um, changed that position in the previous um, previous case. But, but anyway, it, it makes uh, very little difference. The, the main thing is that the load case reduced to um, um, 0.526, so significantly reduced. So putting in this, the, the two ring representation reduced by a factor of um, almost two, the, um, the adequacy factor. Now, you might be um, wondering, um, what um, what actually means in terms of the um, the vehicles that you can carry on on this this, this structure? Um, if you're working to current um, UK standards, then you can go to the um, Limit State website. I'll just pull up a browser in a second. So go to the um, Limit State. Web, web page. So just pulling it up there. So go to products, ring, documentation, and actually there's a technical note which tells you that if you have a 11 and a half ton single axle um, and you have an adequacy factor of at least 0.47, then your max gross vehicle weight is seven and a half tons. So that shows you how you can link this result to um, real world assessment code. What I should say at this point is that the uh, in the UK um, assessment code is changing this year so uh, you need to uh, keep an eye on that if you're working in the UK and there are some reasonably significant changes um, that affect uh, the assessment of masonry arch bridges. Okay, so um, I think that's um, probably all I uh, wanted to say on this example. I mean, hopefully you can see um, how easy it is, to, for example, to move to modeling a multi-ring um, um, case. Um, so I could put that, actually put that back and then if I solve, just undo that change of vehicle position and then it should go back to... Um, um, finding 23 as the, the critical case. Okay, so let's just go back then and just to uh, 
to wrap up. Some conclusions. So, what, 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 what have we learned? Well, the shape of the arch in relation to the pattern of loading is important, so measure the shape, um, but also be careful with the pattern of loading. Um, quite commonly for other structural types, for, for example for beam bridges, we're quite happy to use generic load types. For masonry arch bridges, actually the distribution of axle loads is important. So if you can model a true representation of the arch shape and also a true representation of the loading that it's going to be carrying, that's very, very useful. Uh, limb state ring is um, rapid and hopefully you've seen a powerful tool for masonry arch bridges. It automatically identifies many modes of failure, whatever form those take, whether it's uh, multi-ring, multi-span, so for the multi-span um, examples, automatically you identify what the critical mode of response is. And then the last thing um, we covered was you can do a quick assessment using default parameters or you can take advantage of detailed knowledge of a structure and actually enter local features to provide a more informed um, assessment. So that's, that's um, everything that I uh, was planning to cover. Um, are there any uh, questions? Um, so you can use the, um, the, the text box to um, identify questions. So question here, um, example analysis showed rigid foundations is it possible to assess the effects of flexible foundations or to model ground settlement? Um, I would say yes and no. Um, the, the software uses rigid plastic uh, theory, um, so um, it's not possible to, for example, to put spring supports in there. However, um, it is possible to model the effects of, um, of settlements to see what the murder response will be. So for example, if I go to um, this example, if I just delete all the, the load cases, actually move a vehicle off the, the bridge, then if I move the, the, the load off the bridge, you can see that there's no result. There's actually another mode, which will be a subject of another um, um, webinar. I can actually choose, for example, to impose a support movement on um, the pier. And so if I do that, then you can see um, what would happen. I've obviously distorted it too much there. What would actually happen if you have a, a support movement? And it could be a settlement, or it could be some other um, murder response. OK, so I've got um, probably time for one more question before finishing. Um, how would you recommend um, users model bridges with voided spandrels or internal spandrel walls? Okay, so um, there are um, a number of um, things that uh, um, occur when you have internal spandrel walls. One is um, you reduce the, the, the weight of the structure, so what you can do is you can um, if you want to model it as, as a conventional fill, or strong fill or backing, is you need to take account of the, the change in the, um, the unit weight. So you can change that, that unit weight pro rata um, to, um, to deal with that. Um, in the current version, you can't explicitly model internal spandrel walls. Um, actually, very soon we're, we're going to have a... a a new version, so in the next, uh, in the coming months, we'll have a new version where it will actually be possible to model, if you so wish, um, spandrel masonry explicitly. Um, but I think that's probably um, all we've got time for. If you do have any questions, then um, um, Tom Pritchard will just uh, uh, explain how you can get those to us. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. 
And we do hope you found the webinar informative and that you learned some things from it today. Um, if you do have any questions, like Matthew says, then you can get in touch with us either on the telephone, and the details of that are on our website, or you can email us on support at limitstate.com and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have um, that way. Hopefully you'll all be interested to know that we're also planning a number of supplementary webinars throughout the year. I think Matthew may have touched on that. And these will focus on things such as particular problem types, features and applications of Limit State Ring, as well as our other software. So please do look out for the event notifications that we'll be sending out for those via email. And they'll also be on our website and all the usual social media platforms closer to the time of those events. So lastly, again, I'd just like to say thanks for listening. And we do hope that you can join us for one of our future sessions. Goodbye.